the variety of consumer goods at your favorite food store, electronics center, car dealership, warehouse megastore, fashion outlet, or anywhere you like to buy the things you want or need is absolutely staggering. In today's consumer market, you can buy just about anything from just about anywhere. It wasn't too long ago when the products you buy regularly simply were not available at all. So what changed? How has everything become so easily available almost anywhere in the world? The answer is simple, and it is something that most of us rarely, if ever, think about. Modern liner shipping. Liner shipping is the most efficient mode of transportation of goods in the modern world. In one year, a single large container ship can carry over 200,000 container loads of cargo. While individual ships vary in size and carrying capacity, many container ships can transport up to 8,000 containers of finished goods and products on a single voyage. Similarly, on a single voyage, some car carrier ships can handle over 7,000 cars, trucks, heavy machinery, and any other kind of vehicle you can imagine. It would require hundreds of freight aircraft, many miles of rail cars, and fleets of trucks to carry the goods that can fit on one large liner ship. So when you consider that container ships have the capacity to carry several large warehouses worth of goods on a single journey, the cost to transport those goods makes it the most effective method for manufacturers to get their goods to market. The cost of shipping a bicycle from Thailand to the UK in a container is about 10 US dollars. The typical cost for shipping a DVD CD player from Asia to Europe or the US is roughly $1.50. A kilogram of coffee costs just 15 cents to ship, and the cost of shipping a single can of beer is just one penny. The simple fact is that the modern global economy would not exist were it not for the introduction of the container and the liner shipping industry that moves them. So how did it all start? To answer that, we need to look at the shipping of goods before modern containerization. Looking back to the Middle Ages, various ships were in use. The Jong, a type of large sailing ship from New Santara, was built using wooden dowels without iron nails and multiple planks to endure heavy seas. The Chuan, Chinese junk ship design, was both innovative and adaptable. Junk vessels employed mat and batten style sails that could be raised and lowered in segments as well as varying angles. The longship was a type of ship that was developed over a period of centuries and perfected by its most famous user, the Vikings, in approximately the 9th century. The ships were clinker built, utilizing overlapping wooden strakes. The knar, a relative of the longship, was a type of cargo vessel. It differed from the longship in that it was larger and relied solely on its square rigged sail for propulsion. The cog was a design which was believed to have evolved from the longship and was in wide use by the 12th century. It too used the clinker method of construction. The caravel was a ship invented in Islamic Iberia and was used in the Mediterranean from the 13th century. Unlike the longship and cog, it used the carvel method of construction. It could be either square-rigged, caravella rodunda, or latin rigged caravella latina. The Karak was another type of ship invented in the Mediterranean in the 15th century. It was a larger vessel than the caravel, and Columbus's ship, the Santa Maria, was a famous example of a Karak. The one thing that these early vessels had in common was how cargo was loaded for transport across the sea. For hundreds of years before shipping containers, cargo was transported using the break bulk method, with cargo transported on ships in much the same way that they were stored, 
in bales, leather wrapped bundles, boxes, barrels, crates, sacks, drums, and pallets. The loading and unloading of the cargo using this method was inefficient due to the time it took. It was an incredibly labor-intensive process. Crews of men would have to load and unload around the clock. Some vessels spent more time in port than at sea. Very often, much of the cargo would be damaged during the voyage due to poor stowage techniques. This period in shipping history also had to deal with increased thefts and perishable cargo at port being ruined due to the excessive amount of time being spent there. The entire process needed to change and so the industry began to evolve and the shipping container would be that evolution. The beginnings of the shipping container originated from the trucking industry. Malcolm McLean, born 1913, who owned his own trucking business in North Carolina, was one of the entrepreneurs to become frustrated with the current cargo shipping method and decided to do something about it. During the 1950s, he began working on a concept for the use of standardized modern containers for the transportation of cargo across the globe. This meant that the concept would have to adapt to vessels, ports, trains, and trucks, and he was set on a container which would fit all. In 1955, McLean sold his trucking company and bought the Pan-Atlantic Steamship Company, which had docking rights along a lot of the East Coast. After testing a number of designs, McLean invented a shipping container which was stackable, lockable, strong, and durable. The next was to design a vessel which would be able to transport the newly designed containers. The SS Ideal 10, a World War II oil tanker, was purchased by McLean's newly renamed company, Sealand Service Incorporated, and was modified in order to carry the new containers. In 1956, the Ideal 10 transported 58 containers along with 15,000 tons of petroleum from New Jersey to Houston. This cargo transportation was also cheaper than any existing methods. But half-converted tankers would only be able to take McLean's vision so far. The next step was to introduce fully compatible container ships. From 1957, the first vessel, named Gateway City, was in operation, storing a total of 226 containers on and below deck. Now, with a fleet of six container ships, the infrastructure at ports was going to have to improve. Over the decades, ports evolved to have large cranes instead of masses of dock workers, space to stack containers instead of warehouses, larger areas in order to accommodate the bigger container ships, railways, and good road networks. As the 50s turned into the 60s, container shipping was beginning to go global. In terms of value, global seaborne container trade is believed to account for approximately 60% of all world seaborne trade, which was valued at around 12 trillion US dollars in 2017. While the quantity of goods carried by containers has risen from about 102 million metric tons in 1980 to about 1.83 billion metric tons in 2017, vessels have likewise increased their capacity. Between 1980 and 2019, the deadweight tonnage of a container ship has grown from about 11 million metric tons to around 266 million metric tons. But let's not forget the forerunners to these massive cargo moving ships that were so vital in Britain's time of greatest need during World War II. And to meet this need came the American Liberty Ship. Liberty Ships were a class of cargo ship built in the United States during World War II. Though British in concept, the design was adopted by the United States for its simple, low-cost construction. Mass produced on a scale never before seen, the Liberty ship symbolized U.S. wartime industrial output. 
The class was developed to meet British orders for transports to replace ships that had been lost. A total of 18 American shipyards built over 2,700 of these iconic ships between 1941 and 1945, at an average rate of three ships every two days. Easily the largest number of ships of a single design ever produced. The immensity of the effort, the number of ships built, the role of female workers in their construction, and the survival of some far longer than their original five-year design life, make them a true icon of American determination and pride. In 1936, the American Merchant Marine Act was passed to subsidize the annual construction of 50 commercial merchant vessels which could be used in wartime by the United States Naval Auxiliaries crewed by U.S. merchant mariners. The number was doubled in 1939 and again in 1940 to 200 ships a year. Ship types included two tankers and three types of merchant vessel, all to be powered by steam turbines. Limited industrial capacity, especially for reduction gears, meant that relatively few of these ships were built. In 1940, the British government ordered 60 ocean-class freighters from the American yards to replace wartime losses and boost the merchant fleet. These were simple but fairly large for the time, with a single 2500 horsepower compound steam engine of obsolete but reliable design. Britain specified coal-fired plants because it had extensive coal mines and no significant domestic oil production. The first ocean-class ship, SS Ocean Vanguard, was launched on 16 August 1941. The design was modified by the United States Maritime Commission in part to increase conformity to American construction practices, but more importantly to make it even quicker and cheaper to build. The US version was designated EC2SC1, EC for emergency cargo. 2 for a type of ship between 400 and 450 feet long, S for steam engines, and C for design C1. The new design replaced much riveting with welding and had oil-fired boilers. It was adopted as a Merchant Marine Act design and production awarded to a conglomerate of West Coast engineering and construction companies headed by Henry J. Kaiser, known as the Six Companies. Liberty ships were designed to carry 10,200 tons of cargo, usually one type per ship, but during wartime generally carried loads far exceeding this. On 27 March 1941, the number of Lendley ships was increased to 200 by the Defense Aid Supplemental Appropriations Act and increased again in April to 306, of which 117 would be Liberty ships. In preparation for the Normandy landings and afterward, to support the rapid expansion of logistical transport ashore, a modification was made to make standard Liberty vessels more suitable for mass transport of vehicles, and in records are seen as MT for motor transport vessels. In that case, Four holds were loaded with vehicles, while the fifth was modified to house the drivers and assistants. In September 1943, strategic plans and a shortage of more suitable hulls required that Liberty ships be pressed into emergency service as troop transports, with about 225 eventually converted for this purpose. On 27 September 1942, the SS Stephen Hopkins was the first and only U.S. merchant ship to sink a German surface combatant during the war. Ordered to stop, Stephen Hopkins refused to surrender, so the heavily armed German commerce raider Steer and her tender Tenenfels with one machine gun opened fire. Although greatly outgunned, the crew of the Stephen Hopkins fought back replacing the armed guard crew of the ship's lone four-inch gun with volunteers as they fell. The fight was short, and both ships were wrecks. 
The U.S. Merchant Marine, an organization made up almost entirely of civilian sailors, suffered the worst losses of World War II, as nearly 4% of its members were killed or lost in the fighting, worse than the Marine Corps and any other military branch. The Merchant Marine was never designed for frontline combat, on the battlefield or on the ocean. It's made up of mostly civilian members who conduct almost any type of maritime trade in peacetime, from fishing tours to oil shipping. During a war, the federal government can make these sailors into an auxiliary of the U.S. Navy. During World War II, these men were forced into the worst of the fighting, despite their largely non-combat role crewing ships that had to brave not only the seas and storms, but German U-boat wolf packs, who sailed with orders to hunt and destroy the merchant marine. They were the men that suffered the pain of progress.